Hello folks and welcome to your next episode in our 1000 Euro EV build project. Uh, this is the episode you've all been waiting for, which is where we are going to start building a DC motor controller. For those of you just joining this particular series, uh, this is where I am attempting to build a practical road going electric vehicle for 1000 euros or less. Uh, before we jump on the motor controller stuff, I have done a few bits and pieces to the car. So let's go take a quick look at that first. Alrighty, so under the bonnet, uh, the first thing that I have done is I have fitted the taco sensor. So this is a very simple, cheap little uh, proximity sensor. I made a bracket here to, to hold it to the motor frame. And I drilled and tapped uh, six millimeters into the tail shaft and just screwed and, tre and uh, tread lock two standard six millimeter uh, screws approximately 180 degrees apart. And this is going to give us two pulses per revolution on our uh, tachometer sensor which we can use to drive the uh, taco in the instrument cluster. And the second thing that we have done is we have fitted the undercar cables. And there's two of them in this case. The first one is this cable here, which is a five by six square um, mains cable, uh, which we will be using for our charging system. Uh, so that cable goes underneath the vehicle all the way down to the back and you be able to see it too well in here but comes up through the existing uh, part in the chassis uh, where the fuel filler uh, would have been and we've got that just pretty much I just got it hung in there uh, but this is our the second end of that cable which will be coming to our charging port and we'll be handling uh, how we're going to be Fitting a charging port, oh great, in a later episode. Uh, the second cable is a much more heavy duty. It is a 5 by 16 square armoured uh, cable that's designed for, you know, fairly medium duty mains power supply. Uh, this is a very common cable in this part of the world will be used for supplying three phase power uh, to um, to light industrial applications. Now what I have done here, and we go around the back, so this is all P-clipped underneath the vehicle and it comes in here through it land into the spare wheel well and I've gotten rid of all the junk from here. We've installed our 12 volt battery uh, back here in the position where it would be for six cylinder uh, vehicles um, and I've installed a fuse on the, gr the ground and I've used one of the cores so one of the 16 square cores as the battery positive and that goes back up through the cable and comes into the, uh, we pop the cover off the fuse box and that goes on to the battery positive terminal here in our fuse box and lets me power up the uh, 12 volt systems in the car once again. Now we then have these four cores here, so 4 by 16 square. We will be pairing them and using those as part of our forward to back uh, battery link cable because we'll have some batteries up front here and some batteries in the back of the car 
and we'll use this cable here for linking them. Now, I hear you guys saying, Damien, you need to use 50 square cable or 70 square cable to do this. Why are you using that junk? Well, a uh, couple of reasons. The first is proper high voltage rated 50 square cable is quite expensive. You can be lucky and find bits that will do the trick for you. But a long bit like we would need here uh, would be beyond our budget. So when I was thinking about cable, um, I thought about the ability to use multi-core cables like what, you, what I've just Show, I've just uh, shown you and they're much more available uh, just due to their use in commercial electri electricity install installations and I was able to get that stuff um, at pretty much scrap price uh, just by poking around in a heap of, of offcut uh, cables in my local junkyard so I got the uh, cable for doing the battery and the mains I think it was just based on uh, weight I think I was charged a tenner for it so that's a cheap and efficient way to get to get high voltage rated cables uh, for doing your toing and and throwing from front to back for battery and mains power. Now, enough about that, let's get to the motor controller stuff, eh? Alrighty, so here we have the power stage uh, for our motor controller. Mmm, shiny. So, what I am going to do is I'm going to talk you guys through a little bit about uh, the various components that we have here uh, then I'm going to take it all apart and fully assemble it on ca on uh, camera so that you can see how all the bits work together then uh, assuming I don't screw that part up we will do some low voltage uh, bench testing uh, to prove that it's 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 actually working as it should all right so what we've got here is basically a power stage for our motor controller mounted on a finned aluminium heatsink so the first component that you're going to need to get for yourself is some kind of a heatsink uh, this will prove to be the base from which you build everything else up on. Um, these can be had in a variety of places. This, I believe, is out of a uh, scrap variable frequency drive. Um, anything that has large power handling, power electronics in it, will have big heat sinks like this. So that's the first component that you're going to need. Now, I'm going to talk away as I'm disassembling Stephanie this thing. Um, so, the next thing that you then need are some kind of devices to perform the power switching, said power switching. And you need a stronger hand to undo these uh, bolts because you've naturally over tightened them anyway so what I have traditionally used uh, for both DC and AC motor controllers have been these IGBT bricks these are called half bridge mo modules um, these ones here have been rescued from the Enova inverters that I've had following me around uh, for the better part of two, two years now. Uh, so these are 600 amp, 600 volt parts and are basically old-ish but they're fairly modern enough that we can use them uh, for this application. And what I've chosen to do 
for this build has been to connect two of them in parallel in parallel uh, which on the surface of it would give us the ability to handle uh, 1200 amps but not r really because uh, you don't want to try to, to do that good design practice in my humble opinion with IGBTs is to basically rate them for twice the maximum that you're going to use. So we have 600 volts, 600 amps per module. So the maximum that, that I would run through this would be 300 volts and 600 amps. But we're not going to be up near 300 volts with this. We're going to be around the 150 mark. So once let me whip off this driver board here for a sec. Now, your first step is to mount your IGBTs on the heatsink. Now, what I have done here is, in order to do the physical build, I have um, just dry assembled this. I haven't used heatsink paste or, or put in all the bolts. So, I'm going to start off start doing it properly now or at least as properly as I'm ever going to do something because this is an entirely personal experience you can uh, you know use your own skills and your own beliefs to shape how you actually build something and that's how I tend to work um, I don't try to force my way onto people I'm just I'm just showing you some of the little tips and tricks that I've you know or that's things that have worked for for me as I have you know learned about this stuff now so the first thing we're, we're going to do as we're assembling and I'm assuming that you've drilled and tapped the holes and all that kind of thing here is we're going to put some thermal grease heat sink compound on the back of our IGBTs. I've cleaned off all this, degreased de de it, got all the burrs off the holes, all that kind of thing. So let's go and squeeze out some of this crap. Um, looking to get this stuff, it's quite easy to get nowadays. Most computer shops actually stock it because people still build their own computers. Uh, you don't need to go too mad with it. This is kind of probably even way more than you would normally need to put on. Um, I'm going a little bit heavy on this because of the application. You know, it'll just squeeze out when you actually torque down the uh, you torque down the transistors. Um, so once we have the heatsink compound on, try not to get this on your hands. I'm going to flip them over and basically yeah, just drop it in as close to where you want it to be as you can get. Now, there we go. And they kind of float on top of the heatsink compound. Um, so basically get them in there roughly where you want to be. Now the next thing we're going to be doing is uh, screwing down the transistors to the heatsink. I'm going to be using some, you know, just whatever M5 bolts for that. And rather than mess about with all kinds of lock washers and that junk, I'm just going to use some high strength thread lock. And we will apply said high strength thread lock. And I'll do this for all of the screws. Um, I'm going to start them all before I torque them down. Don't need to go crazy with the tread lock, it's just to, uh, because in a car you're going to get vibrations. She's giving me good vibrations. Mm. You know, you're just going to need to be cautious for that. So, why don't I come back when I have all this crap done? Alrighty, so that's all the screws in there now. We, we just got them in loose and the transistors are kind of floating on their heatsink compound. Now, the next part of the puzzle 
is we need to drive the transistors. Each one of these bricks has got two transistors in it uh, can, uh, connected together. Now, in order to use this for a DC motor controller, we need a driver board. Now, as if by magic, here is a driver board that I designed earlier. Now, for those of you uh, that are using these parts, and or other parts, um, the design for this board will be freely available on GitHub, and I will be selling the bare PCBs on my web shop, so you will be able to get this. But put simply, this provides isolated gate drive uh, to the two low side transistors in our bricks and um, turns off the two high sides because we're using the freewheel diode only on the high side transistor and then lets us uh, supply 5 volts ground on our PWM signal to control motor speed. So this is designed to fit and it's a pretty tight fit on these modules, so on the pins um, and on these kind of locating pins here. That's why I've left them sort of just floating free on the screws there because I want to sort of position these rightly. And of course because we're on camera they don't want to do that. Hmm. There we are. Alright. So what I'm also going to do is take one of my bus bars and just make sure that it attaches properly here. Because again our transistors are kind of floating on their uh, heatsink compound. I want to make sure that everything's nice and you know that everything's going to line up, all the bolts are going to line up and so on. So what I'm going to do now is uh, we can get at the two screws on this side. So I'm going to just put a little bit of tension on that one. A little bit of tension on that one. Likewise over this side. And we can actually tension in here as well. Alright, so again, just making sure there's no stresses on anything, that board is still floating up and down the pins, and that guy's nice and loose there, so I'm going to go ahead now and start tensioning this transistor, just using the two screws that we can actually get to here, and we'll do the other ones then, uh, once we have gotten these two tightened up. Take the opposites here. Let's tighten down. Yeah. And that's looking good. So now we can remove that bus bar, remove the gate driver board once again. And we can go ahead now and access all of the screws and tension down our uh, tension down our IGBTs. Yes, you can use, you know, lock washers and other ways of keeping the screws from backing out. I've just been a bit lazy. And just using treadlock. So you might be able to see here as well that uh, some of the heatsink compound is kind of squeezed out there at the front. So I'm just going to wipe that away. Um, you don't have to. It's not going to do any harm anywhere. But I'm just going to do so anyway. And make sure to get some of it on your hands as well because that's essential. Uh, if you don't get it on your hands, you're not really doing the job as the saying goes. Now, so, transistors mounted to heatsink. 
gate driver board. So we're going to slot that back in here now. Now I haven't obviously soldered this board to the pins because I knew I had to take it off to do this procedure. And additionally to that, I'm going to be tuning some of the component values on this uh, so that we get our best possible gate drive. Because we want our best possible gate drive whereby we get the transistors to work as close to ideal um, as we can. So what I tend to do is to just leave them uh, like this. Now when we're finalizing this, we'd be basically soldering the four pins here and the four pins here. Now, you will see that on the transistor we have three big beefy terminals. This one's marked C1, this one's marked E2, and this one is marked C2E1. That's collector 1, emitter 1, collector 2, and emitter 2. So, we are going to connect the two transistors together with three copper bus bars. And, further to that, we're going to connect some capacitance across our bus bars here in a certain way and certain types so let's get to that part next now the first bus bar is the most simple this is the m minus bus bar this is where we will connect the negative terminal from our series traction motor and this bar uh, literally bolts down across the terminals marked C C2E1. So the C2E1 terminals are going to be connected together with this bus bar. I'm just going to hit this with a bit of tread lock here. I'm using these kind of button head screws here because they kind of integrate a washer and a bolt in the same part and as well as that I have, a, I have a nice flat surface and that is kind of important as we'll see in a minute so I'm going to just bring those two down to just as close to uh, tight and I'm going to move the bar as far back this way so as far away from these as I can a little bit of pressure on it with my thumb and basically tension uh, the two studs that's hopefully the last time they've got to be tensioned but they're tread locked and tensioned now that is by far and away the simplest of the tree that we're going to put on here uh, this is a Lemhas 300s current sensor and the reason that I have cut this bar back a little bit here is to allow it to slot over that. But more about that later. So I'll re remove that now just as we're getting to the next part. Now, the C1 terminals and the E2 terminals are going to be connected together in a similar way. We will be applying battery positive to the C1 and battery negative to the E2 terminal. We will additionally be connecting motor positive to the C1 terminal. Now, this is our, let me see, I need to get this into shot for you guys. This is our bus bar set for the uh, C1, which is this bar, and the E2 terminals. Now, a couple of things that you're going to observe here. First is that we have a big electrolytic cap bolted across the two terminals. This is a 2100 microfarad 385 volt radial electrolytic capacitor. Now you will see additionally we have these little small guys and we have one here and another one that goes here. These are called film snubber capacitors and they bolt directly to the uh, 
C1, E2 terminals on our IGBTs. But before we get to that stage, uh, we need to do some extra work here on our bolts because bolts that we have just put in here, as I say, I just dry assembled this. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm putting a few nuts just on the back of these bolts to use that capa capacitor as a way to stop uh, this stuff from drifting around too much because I need to remove these screws from the capacitor in order to tread lock them. So this is our final assembly on this particular part of the build. Very important is that the gap and the spacing on these parts should remain the same because it needs to bolt down onto our transistor. So I'm going to tension him up. That's pretty good. That's going to work out for me, I think. That uh, cap should be pretty loosey there, it is. Great. That's it. All right. This one here. Likewise. Now, the other important thing to remember here is that everything I'm doing with this can be done with just basic tools. There's just all you need is an angle grinder and a drill press or a hacksaw and a cordless drill or a mains drill or all you need to be able to do is cut square, which of course I can't do, and drill holes. And you will be able to take care of the hardware uh, side of this particular build. So now that we have that done, we take those nuts off. They were only a temporary fitting. And now bring our heat sink back into, back into play. And we're going to flip our capacitor up like this. I'm going to put a little bit of tread lock just on these guys here and we're going to bolt this whole affair down. Now, a little bit because we might have screwed up here, so I want to be sure we didn't. So I'm going to start these two here. So that one's okay. That one's okay, that's a very good sign. And uh, we take our other snubber capacitor here. And I'm going to put a little bit of tread lock on these. Of course, there's probably people going to be telling me now that the insulation properties of the tread lock will cause me to blow up my house, my cat, my car, the whole and caboodle. Well, I'll be the first to video it for you guys. shouldn't blow up your house, cat or car with this particular invention. But if you do, please don't blame me. And that, ladies and gentlemen, 
with the exception of soldering our gate driver board on there, is our power stage built. Alrighty, so we are back on the bench and back doing something that I haven't done for a long time, which is DC motor controller design. So, let me just walk you guys quickly through our test setup here and uh, then we'll put the camera on a tripod and I will show you uh, the next step in what we need to do uh, to ensure that this controller works. So, starting over here on the left, we have a very ancient but still perfectly functional 32 volt uh, lithium um, iron phosphate uh, battery uh, bank here that I've just taken off a shelf after been sitting there for about five ye ye years and it's still fully charged. That comes up here and provides the DC bus voltage uh, for our controller. In place of a traction motor we have a BMW starter uh, which we have connected to the motor terminals here and that guy what I have done here is I have basically bypassed the starter solenoid so that we're going right in just to run the motor uh, directly from our um, our controller power stage. So what we then have is our oh, silly scope which is going asleep on me and differential probe and we are basically connected across the switch so we're going to be looking at the waveform uh, that the switching transistor is experiencing. Uh, we don't have the logic board built up yet so to provide the PWM input to our gate driver and just using the analog discovery board uh, it's got the waveform generator set up on it uh, we're currently set to 8 kilohertz, uh, 5 volt square wave and 10% PWM. This multimeter here is measuring the battery voltage, currently 33.2 volts. This meter here will measure the motor voltage. And this meter here, I zero it, will measure the motor current. So let's get set up here and I'm just going to go ahead and run the controller and then talk you guys through what's actually going on, going on here. Alrighty, so first things first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the PWM and we're going to run our starter mo motor here and we're going to capture um, some of the transistor switching. So, let's activate our PWM. Can we hear the motor running? And straight away, uh, we're going to be able to just pause that. Turn off the PWM. Now, the next thing that we want to do is we want to zoom in on one of these switching events. I want to get nice and in there. Now, what you're looking at is a plot of, and I hope you can see this by the way, is a plot of the voltage across the switch. Now, let's see if we can get this out a little bit better for you guys. I'll just bring it down there and it's a little better. Now, so what you see here is the switch turning on and the switch turning off. Now, that switching behavior is determined by a few things, but the most, the biggest influence on it are these guys, which are the gate resistors. And we will be going through in the next episode uh, how we actually choose them 
and we will show you how this switching uh, waveform is is influenced now but the reason I'm showing you this to today is I want you to see this part here let's see if I can join a little bit nearer here okay this part here is the reason that we need to have the big uh, capacitors on our DC bus and this is called ringing and what's happening here is this is the turn off e event here so the switch is turned off now it turns on it starts to conduct power so the starter gets power 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 then the switch turns off and as we can see there's a nice little spike here and a sine wave with diminishing um, diminishing amplitude so what we're going to be doing is when we're changing our gate resistors and so forth we're going to be working to minimize this particular overshoot area here because this is what blows things up so we don't want that but in the meantime let's have a bit of a broader look and I'm going to reduce the amplitude there so let's have a bit of a broader look at how our controller is working and actually this multimeter just loves going asleep now let's bring you guys back out of it so all right let's go and we will show you a few of the things that the controller does so I mentioned yesterday that this is a buck converter, but what does that actually mean in, pra in practical terms? We're used to thinking of a starter motor as a 12 or a 24 volt device, right? But we can control the power that's being delivered to a motor via the power stage. So we have a battery down there that's putting 33 volts onto the DC bus and it will take when we run the PW PW um, it'll take about 4 amps at 33 volts and we're going to convert that to our buck converter into a much higher current but a much lower voltage so Let's turn on the PWM once again. Now, we're now putting 1.8 volts instead of 32 volts. We, we still have 32 volts on our DC bus. We're now putting 1.8 volts into that, but we're putting 35 amps in there. Now, what happens if I increase the PWM to 20 or 15 percent? Now we pick up speed. Now I'm putting 40 amps and 3.2 volts into our trusty starter. You can see on the oscilloscope our lovely overshoot. This is the part that we need to watch for. So our controller is now speed controlling our, our starter motor. Let's go up to 20%. Now we're putting 45 amps. 4.7 volts. Our battery is still holding at 31 volts. We're converting that down to 4.7 volts at 41 amps. Our battery current, let's measure that quickly here, 
is 11.4 amps. Now you're going to see a bit of a relationship between the PWM duty cycle, the battery voltage, the motor voltage, the battery current and the, the motor current. Now what I'm also looking for here is I'm looking for any signs of heat in my transistors. We are running 40 amps of motor current at the um, at, uh, minute. And so far, not detecting anything. We will get some because my switching waveform is not the most efficient, particularly on the turn on uh, stage here. Alright, you ready to go for some more? Let's go for some more. 25%. Now up to 42 amps. 6.5 volts. 30 volts on our battery still. Still holding 41 amps going into the starter. Now you're probably not going to be able to notice it too easy on camera, but as we increase the current, the magnitude of the turn off overshoot spike increases. Let's go a little more. Let's go to 30 percent. See? Magnitude of our turn-off spike is now actually exceeding the bus voltage. See this? So there's now the equivalent of 60 volts being experienced by the transistor DC bus. Our starter is warming up lovely here now. You can actually smell the starter. 41.8 amps, 8.5 volts. The battery is still holding 29.8 volts. Battery current is now 18.5 amps. Ten volts on the starter, thirty on the battery. See, we're still experiencing this turn off spike here. Now you can see them. And see these little guys happening during the turn on. That's not good. This is called the Miller effect. So we need to fix that. It means that our transistors are trying to turn on but are getting fought back by the Miller capacitance. That. Alright, let's cut this off. This is why we do low voltage testing uh, when we're designing a DC motor controller or in fact any power electronics device um, because these effects show them themselves up uh, quite readily uh, so if we can identify them when we have safe levels of voltage and current and fix them then it vastly redu reduces the chances of our blowing ourselves up which is always beneficial right alrighty folks I hope you have enjoyed this particular episode I'm hoping I can keep the controller design stuff down to two but 
beginning to suspect it might stretch to three episodes. Uh, so apologies for that. But there is quite a lot of stuff that I want to cover in this because some of the questions that I've been getting recently um, have really shown me that there's still a lot of confusion out there amongst people on how this stuff actually works. So I want to try to mix a bit of the practical and uh, theory into this uh, build for you because I'm hoping this is the last DC motor controller that I that I build. Um, I'd really like to the next build to be AC, which I think it will be. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm going to wrap things up there. We will be back with the next installment on this build fairly soon. Apologies for the delay in getting videos out. There's just been some life stuff in the way. And I've got to earn some cash along the way too. Now, uh, with that in mind, please check links in the description for my Patreon and PayPal should you wish to support me financially. Um, also, there will be a link in the description to my GitHub page where you will be able to download uh information on all the projects that i have released opens open source including the igbt driver board uh, that we have just uh, seen working i will also have some of the bare pcbs available in my web my web shop so link in the description to that as well so that's about it for now uh, see you guys next time and happy Miller capacitance, Miller capacitancing, Miller capacitance limit, happy Miller capacitance elimination.